Okay, here we is on a beautiful, uh, it's called a sand prairie. It's basically, you know, a giant deposit of sand that flowed in the Kankakee Torrent, uh, which happened roughly 19,000 years ago. It lasted about two or three days. You know, it was, a, it was basically a glacial dam broke, and this huge river uh, just flowed south, you know, and it deposited all this sand everywhere, and otherwise it would just be, you know, a normal tall grass prairie. But instead, you know, you look down there, and you got the, you got some nice sandy soil down there. See that? And you know, so because of that, uh, you get a little bit different of a plant community than you would otherwise. Okay, so here you go. Here's a, here's a pretty interesting one. This is a Euphorbia corallata. Now, Euphorbia, of course, is a genus. Uh, there's a lot of succulents in the genus. Many things that people call cacti, you know, they're the, the South African Euphorbs, they... They look like cacti, but they're not. They're completely unrelated. It's just a case of convergent evolution, you know, adapting to the same environmental conditions. It's so developing the same morphological features like the spines and the succulents, okay? And somehow, this is in the same genus. I almost can't believe they haven't broken that genus up, but uh, regardless, it's a wonderful family. It's a very uh, interesting family, and euphorbias are known for having very reduced flowers, okay, meaning that... Uh, you know, they're just very simple as flowers. They got they got a flower structure. Here's a word you'll hear in a euphorbia dungeon should you ever go into one, cyathea, all right? And uh, basically, it's just a, a very uh, simple, reduced uh, flower. It's not very complex, you know, just bare bones. Those white things that look like petals are not actually petals. They're petaloid bracts. Uh, this plant is um, mono, monoecious. It's spelled M O N O. See, I forget how to fuck. I'll write it up later. But either way, all, all you got to know, monoecious means you either have male or female flowers. You can have them both in the same plant, but no flower is perfect. So a flower does not have both male and female sexy parts. A flower either has male parts or, or female parts. And this is mostly uh, this particular plant. You know, I've just been oogling it for the past five minutes, checking it out, taking some nice full frontal shots of the, uh, the uh, you know, the sexual morphology and what this shit uh, this plant is mostly male, okay, so get up there and look at that and you can see stamens I think it's only got one female flower on it. Okay, so there you go in between my fingers is a female flower with the stigma Looks kind of messy and then uh, over there on the right you got the male the male flower with the little stamens and what the shit So you got male and female flowers on the same plant. It's called being monoecious if this only had one type of uh, flower sex, you know like a, it just had a male on its on the plant that'd be called dioecious, and then of course if it had, uh, you know, if the flowers had both male and female parts in the same flower, it'd be called the perfect flower. So there you go, Euphorbia corallata. Crazy, crazy to think that this fucker's related to all those big South African bastards, you know, to get the enormous, enormous cacti. Like I mean, the whole family's huge. You know, I'm not sure how many species couple thousand at least you know distributed all over the world the rubber tree is a euphor you know some of the, the plants you got in those tacky office buildings you know some of those are euphorbs a lot of them uh, bleed latex they bleed a, a toxic uh, milky sap oh yeah look at him getting it in little monarch uh, larvae on a goddamn asclepius hortella the narrow milkweed Narrow leaf milkweed, one of the narrow leaf. There's like five or six goddamn species of milkweed within this small area. We'll see, we'll see, pause. Maybe he's getting bashful. Anyway, there's the leaves on it. Look at it. Look how, look how elongated and narrow. Probably a big goddamn tuber down there, too. Anyway, here, of course, is the real stunner and one of the most impressive plants here. Uh, you could clearly see the sand everywhere. This is a Opuntia humifusa. And it probably. Uh, you know, plus a lot of people's minds to learn that there's a, a a cactus that's native to an area where it gets about, you know, negative 30 degrees below zero in the winter. But uh, there is. This thing flowers in June. It's got, a, you know, about golf ball sized yellow flowers. And uh, you'll see it just lacks spines. It doesn't have any spines. It's uh, almost worse than spines. It's got these very irritating little hairs called uh, glockids. That uh, you know are kind of akin to fiberglass, and uh, the whole uh, opuntoid subfamily of the cactus family has glockids. You know, you look at uh, other subfamilies. Uh, you know, like the obviously the saguaro doesn't, the uh, San Pedro cactus doesn't, the peyote doesn't.
But our punches have glockets. All the, uh, you know, choyas, the cylindrical punches, and the, the prickly pears, the old punches. They got the glockets. You could clearly see them right there, sticking out of those aerials. Those little orange fibers, they just uh, look like little orange knobs right now. But uh, I assure you, they're one of the most goddamn irritating things to get stuck in your skin, you know? You'll get them stuck in your skin and you won't pull them out. And then three weeks later, you'll get what looks like a zit, you know, but it's just a little blister filled with pus, you know? It's uh, it's <laughs> it's pretty gross. But then, of course, when you pop it, uh, the little uh, espinas pop out. There you go. There's a real nice illustration of those glockets sticking out of the aerials. So, and they, they you know, they spread pretty easily. They propagate pretty easily. There's a bunch coming up uh, under this mound right here. And uh, what the shit is this? It's a solanum. It's a nightshade of some kind. What is that, a puff bone? I don't know. I don't want to touch those glockets. God damn it. But, uh, yeah, you know, they're mostly clonal. See, there's a fruit right there. Just looks looks just like, uh, you know, one of the, the prickly pear paints. But... And these go, I think they go, I think they go into a Nebraska, you know, I think they got some on the Indiana Dunes <laughs> over there. A punch of Humafusa. Oh, look at that. Look, it's a sassafras. Oh, you could chew on it. It's got that nice mucilaginous texture. Almost a little bit spicy, you know. I think they throw it in some food to make it taste nice. I don't know, you know. More if you could put it on a pizza or in a burrito, maybe not. Anyway, it's in the Loraceae, which is the basal angiosperm clan, one of the more earlier branching lineages of angiosperms, which of course doesn't mean that the, the plant, when you call something basal, you, you imply it's an old lineage. You don't necessarily mean the fucking plant evolved in a Cretaceous, okay? It just means it's part of a lineage that branched off from the rest of the lineage uh, in the Cretaceous. You know, Loraceae, of course, is avocados. It's uh, the bay laurel tree. A bunch of cool shit. Oh, I think, uh, I think. Well, magnolias are in a different. They're in a different family, but same order. But you get the point. It's just one of the earlier branching. It's a relative of the more primitive uh, structures of uh, the angiosperm phylogeny. All right. Anyway, uh, one last thing I forgot to mention. We're getting some water. That's so nice to see because we don't get that in California. You know, it's just a nonstop uh, rain of pollution dust and a, a wildfire smoke, at least in the summer. So the reason that these can tolerate. The cold temperatures, okay, is because they got the betalain pigments, which all cacti have, red pigments. Uh, they're only members of uh, the Caryophyllales order, which cacti, spinach, beets, and all that shit are in, have betalain pigments. But not all the members of the Caryophyllales have the betalain pigments. Betalain is actually named after beets. Betalain is the same pigment you see in a beet. So that's why when you eat a beet, you take a shit the next day, you think you're dying, you got colorectal cancer, you go to the doctor, you know, make an ass of yourself. Blame the betalain pigments. Anyway, the betalain pigments, what they do, you know, when they get, these get super red in the winter, they, uh, they help reduce, you know, uh, exposure to the sun, to the sunlight. They concentrate the sugars. I don't know if the betalain pigments concentrate the sugars, but that pigmentation is very important in the cold temperatures. But they do concentrate sugars, which work as a kind of antifreeze in the tissues. So they'll get all shriveled and look like shit, but they can hold true in those, you know, 35, to 40 below Fahrenheit uh, cold temperatures, especially now since we get the fucking super cold winters, since the jet stream can't keep its uh, can't keep its act straight, it wanders, you know, because you got more warming at the poles. This is a obsolete the racist grandpa trigger warning again right here. You get more warming at the poles, much more so than you do at the equator when you get climate change. So because the poles warm more, it, it causes the jet stream, which normally goes like that, to start going like, yeah, and you get the wandering. And I believe uh, it can also be tied to sometimes while you get that high pressure system off the coast of California, we get super dry temperatures. I don't know. Uh, you know, if you don't believe in climate change, you could find whatever information you can. It's all bullshit, but you can find whatever information you can online to suit your own uh, narrative right there. That's kind of the, the tragedy of the modern day. You don't like something, you don't like something about reality, you just call it fake. doesn't matter if it's real or not. Anyway, uh, regardless... These can tolerate extremely cold temperatures. They just get really shriveled and red. And then, of course, when the spring comes, you get this uh, illustrious and beautiful... Still got the sassafras in my mouth. Still got that illustrious and beautiful 
uh, Midwest summer thunderstorms, you know, or the spring spring rains, they just perk but right back up, you know, get all fluffy, inflate again with the waters. You know, cacti are just basically little batteries full of carbohydrates and water. You could rip this out, take all the roots off. It wouldn't, you know, it it probably wouldn't die for a couple months. You know, they can last an immense amount of time. There was a barrel cactus uh, in a project. I don't know where they, I think they did it in Arizona. But anyway, they, they took a barrel cactus, threw it in a closet. Uh, it's what I would call cactus abuse, but they threw a barrel cactus in a, in a closet in the dark with no water for, you know, five years. That thing lived when they brought it back out, threw it in the ground and started growing again, gave it some water. And I actually had a, po this is going on far too long, but I'll finish it up soon. I had a, a Mammillaria hyderi, some feral pigs had dug up in South Texas. I picked one of them up it in my car it got put in police lockup for a year and uh, i thought it was a goner actually i knew it was going to be fine but when i got the got it back from the evidence locker a month ago that's a whole other long story uh, i put it in a little pot and it started growing again just fine look at this you could tell i mean i could tell before i seen the flowers just from looking at that highly uh, serrated leaf margin right there it does uh, the foliage you know look how hairy that shit is i could tell this was going to be in a rose family in rosaceae Okay, and then of course, you know, it's confirmed when you get up there and you look at those flowers. See five distinct petals. This is agrimonia. I forget the I forget the species. I think it was Parva flora. I don't know what the fuck. Something like it's an agrimonia though. Is the genus Rosaceae. Then over here, this is pretty interesting too. <clears throat> Actually, this is a rare one. A little Platanthera, native uh, orchid. These have really gotten fucked because of uh, habitat loss. You know, and it's done flowering, unfortunately, so I can't show you the beauty, the majesty of uh, Platanthera. But we get, a, we get a bunch of them out the, out west. This might be Lacera. I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. Typical uh, parallel venation of the monocots. Look at those big bracts, those big spiky bracts on that spike. See that? Do you see the bricks? See the bricks? What is shit? Look at those bricks. The flowers are done. And then of course they when they mature, they mature into a, into a capsule with a bunch of tiny powdery seeds. Because all orchids have a symbiotic relationship with fungi. You know, so you don't need too much of that endosperm in there. You just gotta land in a good spot and uh, get you know, hope hope the fungi get you going. Oh, and that was, that was nice. A little quick uh, thunderstorm over there. Got some nice lightning. Passed by in about, I don't know, three or four minutes. Dumped a lot of rain. Got just, uh, you know, just hit out under the trees over there. It's so nice to get summer rain because we don't get any in California. Anyway, here's uh, Senaheba carpa. Sace alpinoid subfamily of the uh, pea family, Fabaceae. You can see the pinnate leaves, which are a big giveaway as to the family. And then you get up there and... You see those flowers. Remember, they're not the typical, uh, they're not the typical uh, pea flowers, or what you mostly associate with the pea flowers. They're the Cesalpina subfamily. You know, so if you get up there and look what's going on, you know they don't have the typical uh, keel and banner and all that shit. Very beautiful though. You know. Then over here you got the coffee family member, Cephalanthus occidentalis. Which I can't believe is Occidentalis because the leaves look a little bit different from the Occidentalis that we get in California. You know? And it's, uh, you know, you could, it's a cluster of flowers. When you look at them closely, you could see they're, you know, typical four petaled, fused petals, united petals, salverform corollas. You know? Just salverform just means like a tube, shaped like a tube. Who the fuck is hanging out right there? You can get the little fertile fronds that it's sensitive fern. I seen some dotter here last time too, but uh, it's a little baggy, you know. There's hibiscus and shit. A lot of nice stuff going on, but it's just too, uh, you know. It's like you got to wade through two or three feet of water to get over there. Nice dogwood. Got some angelica back over there. Okay, so you see that little dot right there, right there near the axis that is stamped. It's called an extra floral nectary, and basically what it does is it produces nectar, i.e., sugar water, to attract ants which will then hang out on the stem of the center and, uh, you know, just beat the shit out of uh, any potential, uh, you know, other insect pests that might come to uh, harass it, 
or uh, cause the problems, you know. It's a pretty ingenious method uh, of getting someone else to, you know, act like your bouncer and keep the riffraff away. Got those pedals so nice, too, you know. It I can't believe it took me so long to get into the P family, the legume family, you know, because I used to not give a shit because, you know, I used, to, I used to say they all look alike, but, uh, you know, and I, <laughs> I guess they, they kind of do, but they're just fucking... Uh, they're so well adapted. I mean, you get so many of them in deserts because they got the nitrogen fixing thing, you know. 20,000 species almost all over the world except Antarctica, you know. Pretty impressive goddamn family. Anyway, there you go. There's that senna and there's a, a extra floral nectaries. I think most of the species in the sennas do that. But look at this. Look at this guy right here. A member of the gentian family. Which, uh, you remember that Fraser speciosa up in a uh, high altitude of mountains is a, a member. This is a Bartonia virginica, and it's thought that this is hemiparasitic, meaning it's got chlorophyll, so it can photosynthesize, but it also needs to borrow a little bit from its neighbors, you know, which is, it's not too bad, I understand, you know. It's got highly reduced leaves. It's got almost no leaves. It's just a little spike coming out, coming out of the mossy ground. Pretty interesting. Quite a few uh, members of the gentian family are parasit, parasitic, either hemiparasitic or out outright parasites. Then, of course, you got this Liatra spicata. Just, just look at that. Look at like a purple torch in the prairies. Remember the Asteraceae, discoid flowers with no no rays. Just those those long ass styles, almost looking like little pink hairs sticking out. Remember the styles are the female part. You know, and normally on plants, they're not uh, as pronounced as they are on an Asteraceae. But when you see those little bug antennas sticking out of each individual little florid on a sunflower, that's the style. God, Liatris is a fucking great genus. A lot of diversity in them. So look look at this. Look, we're just about three feet up from over there, all right, where there's a lot more, you know, kind of marshy stuff going on. This is more of a drier upland forest. You got that nice moss on the ground. Uh, you got the, uh, actually this, this is pretty interesting. This little bolete. You can tell it's a bolete. Look at it. You can tell it's a bolete because it doesn't have gills. It's got pores. These are mycorrhizal with the trees. Mycorrhizal with these oaks. It's some kind of black oak. Not too familiar with my quercus out here yet. But, uh, but yeah, it's a bolete. Just look at the, that netted, it's almost like netted venation. I'm not sure what you really call it, you know, low fate? I don't know. On that stem, I have to show this to Alan Rockefeller, my friend Alan. But look at those, look at those pores on it. Oh my God. So some of the boletes are edible, some are not. I mean, you can eat them, but you'll end up puking and shitting your guts out for a couple of days. I don't think any of them are deadly, maybe. But, uh, you know, it don't really need to find out either. But, uh. It's pretty exciting, regardless. I think that moss is a polytrichum. Anyway, over here, you got, uh, you can see it drops about three or four feet, which is just enough for, uh, for things to start changing. You got a little polygala. These are weird. Kind of, uh, kind of like a fabaceae, like a pea family. But, uh, where'd that goddamn orchid go now? I was just gonna... Oh, yeah, here we go. This is, I believe this is Platanthera flava. You could get up there. Like I said, it's mostly done flowering, but uh, you could still see those tiny little orchid flowers, just a spike of orchid flowers. And then of course, parallel venation on that leaf. And uh, how's the underside of that look? The abaxial surface on a lot of orchids uh, has an almost metallic sheen to it. I mean, not metallic, but shiny sheen to it. And you can really see the, uh, the venation on them. You know, I saw a species of uh, Piperia, I think it was Colmanii, down there in uh, Baja, in the, the coastal succulent scrub. And it hadn't sent out a spike yet, but I knew it was a, an orchid as opposed to one of the other monocots with a basal leaf thing going on, just by the abaxial surface and how it looked. I, I sent the coordinates to a friend of mine who's studying that genus. He went back there two months later, got some real nice money shots, some real nice full frontal of the flowers going off. Oh yeah, you, you still got a little bit of uh, tepals, a little bit of the, the uh, Corolla, the Perianth 
on those uh, flowers right there again it's Potanthera flava and it's right at the transition between the more low-lying uh, you know more wet riparian area down there there's actually a little bog in there uh, versus the upland uh, oak forest uh, you know and it's only a difference of about three or four feet which shit for the Midwest that's high elevation you get a total biotic community going on with just a little bit of elevation Okay, so you can see we're in an oak woodland right now. And oaks, of course, are symbiotic with the fungi in the ground. It's called being mycorrhizal. And uh, wherever there's a healthy mycorrhizae and a very intact mycorrhizal soil, uh, you have this guy, or at least a relative of him, those uh, mon mycoheterotrophic ericaceae. This is Monotropa hypopetus. And, uh, you know, I've never actually seen this uh, this genus at all in Illinois. But it's, again, it's a member of the blueberry family that parasitizes a fungi in the ground. And again, it's a relationship that's thought to have started, uh, you know, symbiotically. Because most members of the blueberry family are symbiotic with the ground fungi. But, uh, you know, at some point they just turned, uh, they just started parasitizing them. You can see this guy produces absolutely no chlorophyll. He does not photosynthesize at all. And, that, you know... It just, uh, this is a relatively small one, but, uh, incredible, you know, pretty cool plant. Then, of course, over here, another, uh, mycorrhizal mushroom. These, uh, tiny, it's a tiny amanita, but, uh, you can see that those little white, uh, markings. I'm not much of a fungi guy, like my, like my buddy is, so I don't know, you know, if he was here, he could probably tell you what you call that, but those, a lot of amanitos get those little... Looks like a white bread crust, you know, on a panaderia. You know, you go to the panaderia, you get some of that nice Mexican bread. They got the crust that looks like that. A lot of amanitas get that. And then, of course, they got a, uh, god damn it, I forget the name of it. The little egg thing that it comes out of. Not an egg, but, you know, uh, the cup down there. You know, I really, I need to get on top of my game here if I'm going to talk about mushrooms. I don't know. Don't know, don't know too much uh, shit about shit. But, uh, anyway... So there you go. And of course, there's the oak that's symbiotic with the fungi that this guy is uh, stealing from. Monotropa hypopetus. Nice, wonderful uh, sand prairie. Okay, this one's pretty weird. This will blow your mind. This is a member of the citrus family, Rutaceae, Talia uh, trifoliata. And it looks, the way it's spelled, it looks like Pitalia. But uh, it's got these little, they almost look like, uh, if I can get these Samaras, they almost look like a little uh, Elma. Elm Samara, you know, but uh, but it is a, it's a true member of the citrus family, and it's I believe it's got a little bit of smell to it as well. Anyway, I've seen this genus, uh, same genus, different species out in California. I've seen it also in uh, uh, Mexico. You know, the citrus family is mostly subtropical, but you get a couple members that come up into the higher latitudes. You know, and here's one of them. Now look at this, it's a species of solanum. It's solanaceae, the nightshade, the pepper, the tomato family, solanaceae. This is solanum carolinens. Look at those prominent uh, goddamn uh, stamens. Those yellow things, the stamens, and you got a little green stigma in there. Okay. But more importantly, and very uh, interesting, is these abaxial spines. And that uh, main rack you see the leaf right there. Look at it. Very uh, disinviting to anything that might uh, prey on it. A lot of different species of solanum. Get some real cool ones in Central America. They can get up to 10 feet tall. They got purple flowers normally. Same thing with the yellow anthers though. You know. And I'm just kind of hoping it's not, it's not too ticky today. You know. And they are out there. And most of them carry Lyme disease. You know, and this would be a good spot because it looks like uh, looks like somebody was laying down here, probably a deer, you know, and maybe some of them jumped off. And, uh, you know, you can get some really tiny ones. You get If you're lucky, they're big and you can see them before they bite you. But they can also be incredibly tiny. What is this? Okay, that's not, not the poison oak. Let's check out this Silphium perfoliatum over here. The way through a forest of milkweed. But you got Silphium perfoliatum. And guess why it's called perfoliatum? Because this is called being perfoliate, at least if you're a leaf. Just means that it looks like the stem pokes through the leaf. You know, there's, I mean, look at it. There's no stock, 
and they're so you know they're so perfoliate and uh upturned that they kind of catch the water you know so you'll see little birds and shit coming by to hang out and drink you know we just got a rainstorm 15 minute rainstorm it was pretty delightful i haven't had that since i was in uh, the highlands of oaxaca last year at least warm rain i haven't had a nice uh, warm summer thunderstorm so of course you can tell it's in a sunflower family asteraceae sylphium perfoliatum there's probably five or six species of sylphium uh, indigenous to, the, to this area you know the, the tri-state area is what they call it in the uh, the the local commercials for uh, used car lots and personal injury attorneys the tri-state area okay and uh, again sylphium perfoliatum but the thing that's nice about the sylphiums and i tell you this anytime anyone's looking at a goddamn species in a sunflower family you know you don't send me a pic that's just like that you send me a pic and you tell me to identify it, i'm just going to tell you it looks like a dyc damn yellow comp actually I, I don't use that word anymore because it's a slur ever since i fell in love with this goddamn family but the point is you can't tell much if you just look at it like that you really got to look at the back side all right turn it around look at the back look at those phyleries see those those bracts these are diagnostic in sylphium Almost all the sylphiums have big, uh, almost, I wouldn't say ovate, but certainly obtuse. The tip is obtuse, meaning the apical tip is wider than a 90 degree angle. They almost all have those obtuse bracts like that, you know, in multiple series. I think they got chiggers here because I'm feeling some tingly shit all over my legs and uh, it doesn't feel too nice. I guess I'll deal with that later. I'll take a permethrin bath or some shit. You know, invite the cancer later. So you got those phyleries, and uh, you know even you know sylphium integrifolium, sylphium laciniatum, you know sylphium uh, terebinthinaceum. They all got phyleries like that. There's a real weird one in uh, in Texas called sylphium albiflorum, which has got white flowers, and I guess it grows pretty slow. But that's a that's a beautiful plant. I'd love to see that. Endemic to Texas, I believe. Like you can see the follicles just starting to form. Follicle just means it's, follicles are just a type of fruit. All the all the milkweeds have follicles. They only split open on one side. And you got a bunch of little feathery seeds and bullshit in there. So look at this, another Asteraceae dungeon. Here we go. This is Ratabita. This globose capitulas, almost dome-shaped capitulas, and then you got the uh, what do the phyleries look like? Oh yeah, there they are. They're reflexed, reflexed phyleries. Ray flowers that kind of point down away from the away from that capitula, and then a bunch of little individual florets. Pretty interesting. This bastard, look at this, Sylphium laciniatum, real real scabrous, real uh, abrasive like sandpaper on a stem. And look at those phyleries. These phyleries aren't fucking around. They're like spikes. Then of course you got the flowers. This is a this is another one of the most beautiful Sylphiums. They're all so nice. Doesn't that just make you feel less homicidal? Look at it. Look how pretty it is. It's so nice. She's towering above all the tall grass. You know? Like a beacon for the pollinators and what the shit. And of course you got them leaves. Highly, highly dentate and lobed. Not, not even dentate. I guess they're... They just... And they got, you know, real uh, stiff hairs on them. Look at it. On both surfaces. Who's gonna want to nine on that? Like, like again, like sandpaper. It's like a 60 grit sandpaper. Sylphium laciniatum. Then we got another Sylphium. So there's three species so far today. Uh, this is in Sylphium integrifolium. Again, look at those phyleries. Huh? It's not just a DYC when you look at those phyleries. Look at how big they are. God damn it. And you got almost not perfoliate leaves, but sessile, no petio, perfectly opposite. Monodella fistulosa, Lamiaceae, the salvia family. Oh, yeah. Look at that guy. You got what's called a verticillaster, which is just like a world inflorescent that circles around a stem. A lot of, a lot of members of Lamiaceae get that. You know, and then, of course, this, too, has opposite leaves. Leaves perfectly opposite each other. And when you grab that leaf, it smells real nice. Actually, it smells kind of strong. You know, it's kind of, kind of brutal. Oh, and then we got my favorite Arnold Glossum. This guy's still going off. Look at us. Oh, yeah, it is so nice. 
These are just starting. Look at the styles on these. Look at those styles. See how they're bent back like that? It's a diagnostic factor right there. See how they were curved like that? Like a Y that had both the both the arms of the Y bent back. One series of fileries. Almost uh, almost like plastic. God, I love these. And then of course when there's when they're done, when they got a seed, they got a big ass pappus, which is a dandelion fluff. Oh shit. Look at this guy over here. Come on, what are you doing? What you doing? You got you can't we you can't hang out there? You gotta get out of the road. Wait a minute. You can't hang out inside. I'm gonna just hold on, come here. I'm just gonna put you back. No 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 no. Alright, get into the bush. Where well, you're safe, goddammit. Get into the bush where you're safe. Otherwise you're gonna get eaten by a hawk or something. If some asshole let his cat out. Well, if some asshole let his cat out, hopefully the coyotes will get it, but. You gotta get in there, get in the bush. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do that later. I'll throw his ass back in the bush. But uh, what was I looking at? Oh yeah. Here we go. So you got a, a glabrous, almost purple stem. Glabrous leaves. Remember, they feel, they feel rubbery. They feel kind of rubbery. That's a, that's a tall bastard right there. Gotta love the honor blossoms. What, what are you doing? Do you know the concept of staying alive? Do you understand how that works? Do you know there's lots of things that would like to eat you? Okay, I'm going to give you a little tutorial in this. You got to get in there or else something's going to eat you, okay? Could be a snake. Could be a, a fox. All right? Could be a hawk. Owls, owls would just dive on your ass. All right? Thankfully, there's not too many cats around here. I think the coyotes keep them in check, thank God. Get in there. Get out the road. What are you doing? You believe this guy? He's not moving. He's just hanging out. You know? No, you don't care. All right, whatever. What you you got to get in there. You got to get back in the bushes, okay? You can't be hanging out. Come on. Go. Get back in there. Just go. Come on. No, yeah, get in there. Get in there. All right? Get in Get in the bushes, God damn it. Get in the... You can't be hanging out here. All right? You're going to get eaten. Get out. Come on. Get out. Get in the bushes. What you doing? You fall out? Yeah? Get in the bushes. You Come on. Go. 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 Get in there. 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 Come on. Get in. Get in. Get in the bush.